pursuant to applicable law and my determination that attendance by remote means is necessary because an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent due to the declared public health disaster caused by COVID-19. This meeting is conducted via video conference. We will now have a roll call to establish quorum. Will the aldermen please make sure their microphones are unmuted at the time that the clerk calls your name? Thank you. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Lespada. Here. Alderman Lespada is present. Alderman Hopkins. Present. Alderman Hopkins is present. Alderman Dow. Here. Alderman Dow is present. Alderman King. Present. Alderman King Alderman. is present. Alderman Hairston. Present. Alderman Hairston is present. Alderman Sawyer. Here. Alderman Sawyer is present. Alderman Mitchell. Present. Alderman Mitchell is present. Alderman Harris. Here. Alderman Harris is present. Alderman Beal. Yep. Alderman Beal is present. Alderman Zalowski Garza. Here. Alderman Zalowski Garza is present. Alderman Thompson. Here. Alderman Thompson is present. Alderman Cardness. Here. Alderman Quinn. Here. Alderman Quinn is present. Alderman Burke. Here. Alderman Burke is present. Alderman Lopez. Live from West Englewood here. Alderman Lopez is present. Alderman Coleman. Present. Alderman Coleman is present. Alderman <clears throat> Moore. Present. Alderman Moore is present. Alderman Curtis. Here. Alderman Curtis is present. Alderman O'Shea. Here. Alderman O'Shea is present. Alderman Taylor. Here. Alderman Taylor is present. Alderman Brookins. Here. Alderman Brookins is present. Alderman Rodriguez. Present. Alderman Rodriguez is present. Alderman Tavares. Present. Alderman Tavares is present. Alderman Scott. Present. Alderman Scott is present. Alderman Cicho Lopez. Present. Alderman Cicho Lopez is present. Alderman Maldonado. Here. Alderman Maldonado is present. Alderman Burt Burnett. Here. Alderman Burnett is present. Alderman Irvin. Alderman Irvin. Here. Irvin is present. Alderman Talaferro. Present. Alderman Talaferro is present. Alderman Raboyas. Present, Madam Clerk. Alderman Raboyas is present. Alderman Cardona. Present. Alderman Cardona is present. Alderman Waggis. Here. Here. City Alderman Waggis Alderman Waggis Pack is here. Alderman Waggis Pack. Please make sure to mute your Please phone or mute your. Sure mute Thank you. Alderman Rodriguez Sanchez. Alderman Rodriguez here. Alderman Austin. Here. Alderman Austin is present. Alderman Ramirez Rosa. Present. Alderman Ramirez Rosa is present. Alderman Vegas. Alderman Mitch. Present. Alderman is present. Alderman Spasado. Here. Alderman Spasado is present. Alderman Nugent. Alderman Vasquez. Here. Alderman Vasquez is present. Alderman Napolitano. Present. Alderman Napolitano is present. Alderman Riley. Present. Alderman Riley is present. Alderman Smith. Present. Alderman Smith is present. Alderman Tunney. Present. Alderman Tunney is present. Alderman Gardner. Present. Alderman Gardner is present. Alderman Kappelman. Present. Alderman Kappelman is present. Alderman Martin. Present. Alderman Martin is present. Alderman Osterman. Present. Alderman Osterman is present. Alderman Haddon. Present. Alderman Haddon is present. Alderman Silverstein. Present. Alderman Silverstein is present. Any other Alderman Alderman Cardenas is present. Alderman Cardenas is present. Alderman Nugent is present. Alderman Nugent is present. 49. All right, Peter. Your Honor, there are 49 members present. I believe you said there are 49 members present. Is that correct, Peter? 
Your Honor, we did not hear Alderman Villegas recognized. Could you repeat that, please, Mr. Clerk? Um, we did not hear Alderman Villegas respond to being present. We have a quorum. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. God bless America. Please remain standing for the invocation, <clears throat> which will be delivered by Pastor Angelina <clears throat> Lejas of Grace and Peace Church. Pastor. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, again, my name is Angelina Zayas. I am a um, partner with Pastor John Zayas at Grace and Peace. We pastor a church in the North Austin community. Again, thank you for the privilege and the honor to um, pray for all the decision making that's going to happen today. Um, so let's just bow our heads um, for a few minutes and let's just come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, you are a mighty God, and we come before you with a humble heart, asking that you would take control of today's council meeting, guide all decisions and all decision makers, Father God. But most of all, we lift up our mirror to you, Lord Jesus, with the spiritual knowledge to guide us and to continue to help us in the future of our city. We trust you, Lord. And in the scripture, it says in James 4, 2, it says, we have not because we ask not. So Lord, we are asking you that you would take control of every decision that we make today, Father God. We thank you so much for the guidance of our leadership that is before us. And we trust that you have appointed them for the rightful time as such as this. And we ask you that you would just bless us. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Well, read the call of today's special meeting. The following call for a special meeting of the City Council was filed in my office on Monday, October 19th, 2020 at 8.16 a.m. Dear Mrs. Valencia, I hereby call a special meeting of the City Council of the City of Chicago to be convened at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, October 21st, 2020, to be conducted by the video conference for the following pur purposes and for no other purpose whatsoever. One, to receive the executive budget for the year beginning January 1st, 2021 and ending December 31st, 2021, and the mayor's budget message relating thereto. And two, to receive and place on file a communication from the budget director regarding estimated levies. And three, to consider a resolution calling for publication of the 2021 executive budget and setting the date, time, and place of the public hearing on the executive budget. And four, to consider a resolution amending the rules of order and procedure to allow for in-person meetings of the city council and its committees. The special meeting may be viewed via www.shycityclerk.com. Very truly yours, or E. Lightfoot, Mayor. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, um, the chair calls, calls on Alderman uh, Gilbert Villegas. Uh, Madam President, I'd like to record reflect that I've been present. I just had a little bit of te technical difficulties. Madam Clerk, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Madam Alderman, President. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Clerk. I think that was Alderman Irvin. Madam President. Let me go to Harris. I don't know. Will the Alderman who uh, is speaking, please identify yourself. Madam President, Alderman Irvin. Alderman Irvin. The chair recognizes Alderman Irvin. Uh, Madam President, could you have Alderman uh, Viegas repeat what he stated? Um, very difficult to hear what he stated uh, in his last motion. 
Alderman Villegas, I think we were having difficulty. I'm hearing you. Can you please uh, repeat uh, your prior statement? Madam President, uh, just like the record to reflect that I'm in attendance, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Alderman, I apologize, Alderman Villegas, uh, but we, at least on this end, are not able uh, to hear you. Yes, and hear him. Alderman Villegas was trying to report the present. Thank you. Sorry about that. To call in. This is the clerk. This Alderman Villegas was trying to say he's present. We have him recorded as present. Yes, he did. We heard. I heard you. Thank you, Madam. Clerk. Does anybody else hear an echo? Right there. Oh, yeah. Yes, it's terrible. I hear an echo. Yes. yes. They're from the yes, chamber. it's an echo. Does that and a delayed, have and a delayed voice? Can we make sure that uh, all the members are muted to cut down on the echo? And I'm going to ask the AIS folks uh, to address the echo right away. At this time, the chair recognizes um, Alderman Harris. Hi, Madam President, I'd like a point of information. Go ahead. Please proceed, Alderman uh, Harris. I would like the body to know at this time I will not move for the passage of item number four, the rules change today. Um, I will uh, wait for a more uh, opportune time. Uh, thank you, Alderman Harris, for that uh, point of information. At this time, we will proceed with public comment. The council will now begin the public comment period, which is limited to a maximum of 30 minutes. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Any written comments that have been submitted will be posted and made available for automatic review. The first speaker is Mr. Ephraim Martin. Mr. Martin, are you there? Mr. Martin, please press star six to unmute yourself. Yes. To the Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, good morning. My name is Ephraim Martin, President of Martins International. Speaking on behalf of the Black Heroes Matter, a coalition of more than 80 organizations and businesses, and a growing number of people who have signed letters calling for the injustices to John Baptiste Point de Sable, Chicago's founding father, to be corrected in the following order. One, that the 2019 audience proposed by Alderman David Moore and Alderman and Alderman Sophia King for Lakeshore Drive to be renamed the Sable Drive be voted on in this month or before the end of 2020 and ask for the full support of all 50 council members. Two, whereas our coalition has finalized its proposed location for the erection of the 25-foot dock um, Dusaba monument at the entrance of Grand Park and IDB Wells Drive in the medium island that's between the two Indian monuments, 175 feet um, east of Michigan Avenue. We are asking you, Mayor Lightfoot, to immediately approve a 12-foot square land space in the 42 by 35 feet island for us to immediately start the process in confirming prospective sponsors to build the monument. Since your 2020 city budget may or may not allow for a disabled monument, and until such time that the city can make a financial contribution for its founding father. There are prospective contributors who are waiting and willing to support the site, and we need to confirm the site in order to move, for them to move forward. Our third request is that the full city, that a full city holiday be set aside in honor of the Saba who founded this great city. We sincerely need an early commitment as soon as possible to start the real process. 
In the meantime, we have established a GoFundMe um, a campaign um, under the Slab of Chicago, which can be accessed at blackheroesmatter.org for donation. So don't. We trust that you, we trust that you distinguished um, body, mayor and council members in the midst of this pandemic will join Alderman Moore and Alderwoman um, King and others to move in the right direction and bring jo a little joy and comfort to the city by the end of 2020 with a renamed Lakeshore Drive as a Sava Drive and a, confirm, and a confirmed location for the erection of the Sava Monument to welcome everyone to Chicago. It's over 100 years of fighting for the Sava. Let us do it together for the, this Black Chicago founding father. Again, we thank you and God bless you and one love. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Our next speaker is Mr. Tramel Williams. Greetings, Mayor Lightfoot and City Council. My name is Tramel Williams. I'm a lead map management here in the city of Chicago. I am also a part of the Black Heroes Matters for the Stable Coalition. Uh, thank Mr. Ethan Martin for uh, being uh, outlining a lot of the details on our demands and things of that nature. So I won't, won't be long, but I want to be uh, strong. So uh, simply, we are asking for Jean Baptiste Point Du Sable, who is of Haitian descent, a black man, to give, be given his just due. That's simply all we're asking. We're asking that no other monument of any individual uh, be risen or erected here in the city, as well as no other city holiday be given to no other individual uh, po uh, other than Jean Baptiste Point Du Sable, who is the founding father of the city of Chicago. Uh, we're also asking that Lakeshore Drive be renamed uh, Jean Baptiste Point Du Sable Drive. Um, our demands are simple and, and, and quite quite clear and quite forward. I want to thank all the more for being an advocate for this cause, as well as uh, the chief engagement officer, Tina Holmes, for, for meeting with us via Zoom, uh, the coalition of about 80 people, and outlining um, you know, what she think is possible or, or, or steps and in, in ways that we can go about achieving our goals. Um, you guys, are, are, I'm sure, are familiar with our demands, and I just want to ask that you guys please um, give it a second look. I know the budget is tight this year, but uh, to move forward, as Mr. Martin said, uh, at the very least, um, if you guys are supportive of what we're doing, if we can at least at least try to get an idea of, of where the location would be. Um, Ida B. Wells uh, in uh, Michigan Avenue is obviously ideal, but if we can uh, hopefully some type of way move forward in that direction, that way, even if the city does not have the budget or um, to allocate this year, that we can also... Um, have an uh, idea what a location is so that we can go off to private investors and things of that nature. We feel that we, the people, will can get it done if the city doesn't want to get it done or can't get it done. Um, and we understand with COVID and all the things that have happened, how it's put a strain on the budget this year, um, but you know we can't take no for answer. Um, Jean Baptiste Point du Sable uh, is a black man from a patient descent that has not been given his just due as a founding father of Chicago. Um, the busk, um, it's, it's okay, but you know, we think he deserves a, a 25 foot or more erected statue. I think it's only right. Um, and we just thank you guys for um, being support those of the aldermans and people who are support of our cause and just ask that um, please to not forget about us because we won't forget about our cause. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams for your comments. Our next speaker is Carla Langston. Hello, my name is Carla Langston, and I'm a resident of the 46th Ward. I want to use this time to highlight an outrageous situation happening on the south side of the city, and that is the scheduled closing of Mercy Hospital in the spring of 2021. Leaders are using old pre-pandemic data to sell constituents a false narrative of safety. They say that there will be little loss in service due to the closure of this hospital, while the city's COVID-19 cases continues to climb. The loss of this hospital will be a major blow to an already anemic health system on the south and west sides of the city. This is a public health disaster in the making. Defund police and fund public health. I'm also pleading for you to put the brakes on your plans 
the four CPS's youngest and most vulnerable students, their educators and their support staff back into the school buildings in November. Say no to any plan in the future that does not have scientifically supported evidence to prove is safe for our most vulnerable students. Black and brown families and communities are the people most at risk from COVID, and they must be consulted in any planning and decisions concerning in-person learning. Defund police, fund schools so that we can ensure conditions in schools are safe and that we can improve the currently unworkable state of remote, remote learning. I cannot understand how we can find money in our funds to fund SROs in our schools, but no money to ensure families have the necessity to learn remotely, regardless of income. Like a vampire, the city sucks money from black and brown communities, but when providing resources, it gives very little. I wanna urge the city council to vote no on any budget that continues with this city's history of overfunding the police and underfunding black and brown communities. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Langston, for your comments. Our final speaker today is Mr. Tim Langston. Mr. Langston, are you there? Mr. Clerk, uh, Ms. Mr. Langston is not signed in. Your Honor, there are no further speakers who have timely signed up for the public comment period. This concludes the public comment period. Madam Clerk, communications. A communication from Her Honor, the Mayor, to the Honorable the City Council of the City of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, I transmit herewith the proposed 2021 budget recommendations. Your favorable consideration of this item will be very appreciated. Very truly yours, Lori Lightfoot, Mayor, referred to the Committee on Budget and Government Operations. I, City Clerk Anna Valencia, have received a communication from Susie Park, Budget Director, dated October 21st. 2020 pursuant to the section 18-60 of the Illinois Truth, of Truth and Taxation Law regarding the 2021 aggregate property tax levies, which was placed on file. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, in thinking about the challenges and complications of this extraordinary year, a year in which we've been confronted with crisis after crisis, at times seemingly without end. I have been looking back on the history of our beloved city to glean insights on any other comparable time. In the historical record, I have searched for comparisons, but also for solutions. The 1880s, marked the early, through the early 1890s, marked a period in our history that has shades of our current experience. This is right after the great Chicago fire, a time in which there was great unrest. The modern labor movement took root in Chicago uh, during that time with a significant unionized workforce that ranged from socialists to the more moderate Knights of Labor. There was labor unrest as workers fought for fairer working conditions and an eight hour workday. It was in those days that bombings rocked our city and people feared for their safety from groups of anarchists who routinely created chaos in our streets. But it was also during that time that the roots of the modern Chicago took hold. A few years before this period, Daniel Burnham and John Root formed their partnership. A young Louis Sullivan moved to Chicago to re be part of the rebuilding effort. The first steel frame skyscraper was built and the great Frank Lloyd Wright moved to Chicago in 1887. It was in that time Chicago moved from being not just the greatest distribution center in the country, but a manufacturing giant as well. One of our great strengths to this very day. 
In that time, new factories, hotels, train stations, office blocks, theaters, clubs, and department stores were built where the prairie grass once stood. And Chicago put itself squarely on the global map. The 1883, 1893 World's Fair was a marvel that visitors from around the world came to see and became a source of civic pride. But as Chicago remade itself after the Great Fire and manifested unrest and civic uprisings in the 1880s, some profited while others toiled in futility. Fortunes were made by the white landed gentry, while many immigrants from that time and people of color remained at the bottom of the social and economic strata. Now, the lessons that I take from that history are many. Importantly, as Chicagoans throughout our history, we have been tested and we have repeatedly risen to meet and exceed every challenge. But what I also know as a woman of color, in this time, in 2020, as we rebuild, we must continue to bring others along with us on the journey toward the next chapter in our shared destiny. We cannot afford to leave anyone behind. We name my transition effort Better Together for a reason. I know that when all of us are given an opportunity, we all can prosper. During this horrible pandemic, <clears throat> every time that we have shown strength as a city, as when we have worked together as partners, making shared sacrifices and facing the challenges head on together. A recent example is under the incredible leadership of Dr. Helene Gale of the Chicago Community Trust. We recently stood up the Together We Rise initiative. The first component is a fund that will accelerate equitable economic relief for Black and Latinx communities by pooling and distributing philanthropic resources to support initiatives like my signature investment, Invest Southwest. The second component involves corporate commitments to re-envision business practices to ensure our region invests more equitably moving forward. And thanks again to our inaugural supporters, BMO Harris, PepsiCo, and JP Morgan Chase. And I want to especially call out CEO Jamie Dimon, who has made a $600 million commitment to Chicago. And a special thanks to Marty Nesbitt, who is working hard to bring others into the fold. The common theme here is that new beginnings, especially arising from tragedy, require us to face the dawn of a new day with a mindset of togetherness. Not how do I proceed, how do I profit, or how do I chart my own course? No, we, not me, must be our mantra. Togetherness, not individualism, is what will propel us toward a better tomorrow. We have faced a lot in 2020, and this year is far from over. And as this new year dawned, I certainly didn't think that my whole year would be marked by multiple tragedies and crises, back to back to back. I didn't understand that I would be measuring <clears throat> success by daily case counts, percent positivity, hospitalizations, or declining deaths. These and other metrics are now daily reminders of the way that COVID-19 has both completely upended our lives <clears throat> across our city, state, nation, and world. Chicago, you, us, and we have been transformed in the wake of the path of this terrible virus that has cut through our city. We've also been transformed by the many ways, big and small, that we as neighbors have risen to fill voids, address needs, and more broadly rallied to meet this challenge head on. As I've noted before, many books will be written about 2020, and some chapters simply will not be pretty. But I hope as writers opine about this year, 
Some of those stories will reflect the true heart of our city, as told through the eyes of our many unsung heroes, the healthcare workers, the first responders, and the essential workers, and others who generally see gave of their time and talent and resources, all in service of the greater good, to support neighbors that they might never know. People all over have felt the same pull that animated our predecessors in challenging times past that have marked this city's storied history. And like me, many in our city government began the new year without any idea that they would be called upon to serve in ways that they could not imagine because our residents needed us. And the true, as the true public servant that they are, they answered that call. <clears throat> a memory from this most memorable of years, as when we saw the first glimpse of how this horrible virus was disproportionately bringing death and sickness to black Chicagoans, we stood up the racial equity rapid response team. What began as an effort to rapidly and forcefully mitigate the unyielding effects of the virus on black Chicago expanded to address a similar case surge in Latinx Chicago. Now that table has been set and so much good work has been done, but at the outset, the group needed structure and, a, and project management. And one of our city workers answered that call. She had been working on another important mission and that was police reform at the Chicago Police Department, but she quickly applied her management skills to the RERRT ensuring that leaders not only received the assistance they needed, but that their voices were included in decision-making process. So thank you, Margaret LaRavier, for being a critical link in an equity in action model that other cities have reached out to learn more about. And before there was a CARES Act, and before we all be became familiar with contract chasing, a heightened need arose. To be clear, as our beloved public health leader taught us early on, contact tracing is the bread and butter of public health. But we needed more, many more people to fill this vital role. And so in the early days of this pandemic, we issued an all call to city workers, those who could be spared, those whose daily work was important, but could be paused in the face of a higher need. Paula. Taglio was one who answered that call. In her day job, Paula works as a legal secretary in the Department of Law. Paula reflected that as a contract tracer, she bonded with people who were so happy that someone cared enough to call and offer support at a time when they were afraid and often felt alone. Paula also said she benefited from providing much needed emotional support and caring for people in need. Thank you, Paula. From the early days of this pandemic, one of our greatest concerns was making sure that people were not left hungry. Whether our school children, our seniors, or anyone else facing this concern, we were laser focused on making sure no Chicagoans went hungry during this pandemic. We also quickly realized that the need would outpace existing food pantries and other distribution systems. From the city side, Chicago Public Library employees led the way. In partnership with the Greater Chicago Food Depository, the Salvation Army, and many other important partners. Our devoted library staff, from former Commissioner Andrea Telly to Maggie Clem Clemens, Greg Diaz and Desiree Kettler, and many more set up and staff a call center, coordinated in-kind contributions, set up meals for first responders at hospitals in underserved, under-resourced communities. The libraries were closed, but the dedicated library staff opened their hearts and helped feed over a million Chicagoans in the darkest early days of this ongoing pandemic. Thank you, one and all. And you will call the dire warnings that Dr. Arwady 
Dr. Ezekiel and the governor and I issued over the spring regarding a surge that could have overwhelmed our healthcare system. We needed to move fast and guard against a possible collapse. The coordinated efforts of federal, state, and Chicago resources resulted in standing up an alternate care facility at McCormick Place, a facility that became a model for the nation. Now, the list is long of the many people who worked tirelessly over a few short days to stand up that remarkable facility. But one person in particular warrants our praise. In his day job, he works as a project manager at the police department in the Office of Constitutional Policing. But for several long days and weeks, he oversaw hundreds of workers at the alternative care facility that took shape. And despite the fact that his wife was pregnant with their first child and due any day, Sudeep Singh answered that call at great personal sacrifice and helped create a legacy for our city about which we should all be proud. So thank you, Sudeep. And as we moved towards summer and we finally started to see our case counts flatten, another tragedy struck. Not here, but felt here, deeply, profoundly. Eight minutes and 46 seconds felt in many ways like a flashback over centuries. Centuries of racism, overt and systemic, that destroyed the destinies of generations of black and brown people, my people, and left us facing generational poverty, joblessness, health care, disparities and life expectancy gaps, all of which were exacerbated during this pandemic. That righteous outcry arising from the murder of George Floyd permeated our streets, but unfortunately, at times, it got hijacked by others who came to our city to create chaos and to fight the police. As the tensions rose, other criminal elements probed our vulnerabilities and struck by looting and destroying property and with them, dreams. To combat the violence and the looting, we got smarter and established a neighborhood protection plan, which included sending large infrastructure trucks to key commercial neighborhood corridors. The drivers in those trucks stood watch over businesses and property like sentinels. They truly made a difference in thwarting the efforts of criminals who came to loot, but instead were deterred because of the steely-eyed diligence of people like Mark Nickel, a motor truck driver foreman with 38 years of city service, or motor truck driver foreman John Gavin, 20 years of service, and motor truck driver Jesus Velez, 26 years of service. Dedicated city workers whose regular jobs included snow patrol, special events, and garbage collection. Thank you, gentlemen, and your colleagues who answer the call when your city needed you. And these are just a few examples of the countless ways in which our city employees stood tall in helping all of us meet the challenges of COVID-19, a summer of protests and violence, and kept our city moving forward in spite of it all. This year, 2020, not only challenged our workforce, it devastated parts of our economy. You know that the hotel and restaurant industry has taken a beating. Tourism and convention business, along with live music and theater, disappeared beginning in March. And while we have seen a slight uptick of visitors in our city, we continue to be at a historic lows in those areas. A variety of small and micro businesses that never have extensive cash flows have closed do not have a stable banking relationship and have suffered mightily. And if they are still open, they are hanging on for dear life. What has this meant to our city government revenues? Well, you know the answer, ladies and gentlemen. It has been devastating to the tune of an $800 million gap in 2020 alone. And let's review some of the losses. 
a 77.5% decline in the hotel tax, a 49% decline in the amusement tax, a ground transportation tax down 47.8%, parking taxes down 48%, motor fuel tax, motor vehicle fuel tax down 48.5%, and the city share of the sales tax down 35% from projected budgeted 2020 estimates. It has been a very tough year for parts of our economy and for our workers. Over 100,000 Chicagoans have filed for unemployment this year. Many jobs have disappeared and others are offering reduced hours and of course, reduced pay. Despite these hardships and believe they are painful, there are glimmers of a recovery that have been flickering into view. Many local and national surveys of Chicago's economy demonstrate that our economic downturn has not been as dramatic as other big cities like New York and Los Angeles. And as a result, the start of our recovery has been more robust. For example, the Brookings Institution Metro Recovery Index shows that Chicago's economic recovery exceeds those of other large cities. And notably, Bank of America studies show that Chicago's consumer spending recovery has exceeded other large cities and states, both in the aggregate and in the large telltale sectors like restaurants and bars and bricks and mortar retail. And this is true in part because we have been and remain a very open city, but prudently following our public health guidance. A study by Homebase, which measures hourly work data, shows that Chicago leads the nation's large cities in one, volume of employees work, two, number of businesses open, and three, number of employees working. Just last month, in September 2020, the Chicago Business Barometer, a regional view of the economy, saw business sentiment in Chicago climb to its highest level since December 2018. And folks, the proof is in the pudding. Even in the midst of this pandemic, businesses are choosing to relocate to Chicago. Others see us as we truly are, a great, global, vibrant city with much to offer from a talented and committed workforce, a great transportation hub to strengthen tech, manufacturing, life sciences, tourism, and more. And these are just some of the corporate relocations to Chicago since the pandemic. Yerkes Pharmaceuticals relocated from San Diego. Amazon has coming to Chicago to build multiple last mile facilities. The US Department of Energy committed to situating two national quantum information science research centers in Chicago and the surrounding area. This will transform the internet and quantum computing. New cold advanced uh, cold logistics, ILO technology, and Nielsen and Global Consumer Group look to leave New York and assess the options in the US and abroad and chose Chicago. Why? Well, because in the words of the Nielsen CEO, quote, Chicago is a really good place to have a corporate headquarters. A lot of our clients have headquarters in Chicago. We were encouraged by the development of the Chicago technology scene. It's a commercial hub and it has a nice balance, end quote. And we agree. And folks, it's important to note there have been no major corporate relocations from Chicago going elsewhere. So thank you to those companies for choosing Chicago. I am confident that your bet on this great city will pay off big time and more to come. And we were thrilled that for the unprecedented fourth year in a row, Condé Nast Traveler voted Chicago the best big city in the United States. So in 2020, we have definitely taken some punches, some very hard blows. And over the course of this very tough year, we have been on the ropes and the referee has started the 10 count a couple of times. But like Barney Ross, 
the 1930s fighter who grew up in the Maxwell Street neighborhood. We have gotten back up, legs stronger, steely focus, and resolve to fight on. And we will fight on because we must. And I am pleased to say that through this crisis-filled year, we continued to speak our values in the investments we pledged when this body passed the 2020 budget a year ago. A few reminders. In the 2020 budget, we made historic investments in violence prevention, $9.1 million. We made that investment because public safety is about so much more than just using the hard power of the police. We need to support street outreach and community organizations that support individuals and family, young and old. And additionally, we added another 10 million in investments from the CARES Act. And we will continue to ask you to support these initiatives in 2021. In total, there is $25 million increase in anti-violence efforts since 2019. <clears throat> and when it comes to housing, in 2020, we made 10 million in investments for housing and homelessness from our corporate fund. And there was more than 87 million in CARES Act funds that went towards emergency housing and homelessness prevention in 2020. And just last fall, Dr. Arity and I announced a new mental health framework in partnership with a host of community-based providers so that our residents' varied needs could actually be met. That mental health framework included a 2020 $9.3 million investment from corporate funds, supplemented with another $10 million in CARES Act funding that also went to mental health. And in 2020, we also made important investments in our youth to the tune of $36.4 million. When other cities abandoned their summer jobs programs this year, we held firm and provided opportunities for 20,000 youth. And we funded and supported My Shy, My Future, this administration's signature program for young people. My Shy, My Future, named by the inaugural class of youth commissioners, makes critical investments to ensure that no matter their background, zip code, or life experiences, that our young people will be able to pursue their passions and see more possibilities for their destiny in an equitable way. And I am proud that my wife, First Lady Amy Eshelman, leads this important investment in our young people. And thank you, Amy. 2020 also marked the, the continuation of the first ever Mayor's Youth Commission and our first ever Youth Services Corps. Over 1,600 young people who provided critical services to residents as part of the COVID-19 response. And we continued the hard but necessary work around imbuing city government with cultural change around risk management. For example, we are protected to beat our budgeted amount for settlements and judgments by $19 million in 2020. And our chief risk officer continued the work of identifying and mitigating risk in our police department. The Chicago Police Department created a new policy to limit police pursuits that in one five-year span cost taxpayers over $50 million alone in settlements and judgments. The new policy is in place, as well as mandatory training. The same is true of the CPD's use of search warrants. The CPD created a new policy with higher standards and instituted, instituted new training to make sure that everyone knows and follows the new rules. And in presenting our balance 2021 budget to this August body for consideration, I want you to know that I laid down some key guideposts that I will highlight for you now. As I noted in August, when we presented our budget forecast for 2021, we have made choices on additional revenue that aid our recovery, not hinder it. We have worked very hard to be smart and prudent and strategic and make choices that spur growth 
and build wealth. We have avoided grabbing for any revenue source without regard to the consequences on economic recovery. <clears throat> we also did what we did last year and looked inward first and sought ways to deliver services to our residents as efficiently as possible. This budget projects $262.6 million in improved fiscal management. This category of servings, uh, savings includes additional parking meters, better management of accounts receivable, enhanced enforcement of certain fees, and loss of collection savings. As for efficiencies, we expect a total of $168.3 million flowing from non-personnel saving, a new renegotiated health care contract, and a contractual audit and review process. And let me linger for a moment on the contracts review. Through audit, auditing work already in process, we've determined that the city literally has hundreds of contracts that are 10 years old or older. Some date, date back to the 1990s. In many instances, no one in recent memory has asked basic questions like, do we still need these contracts? Are we getting the best price? Or can we get a better deal by rebidding? These are literally hundreds of dollars in contracts locked up in what has effectively become hundreds of de facto sole source contracts in perpetuity, which also means that we are denying business opportunities to potential small, minority, and women-owned businesses that could leverage city business to hire more workers, strengthen their bottom lines, and expand our tax base. Now, it is easy to do nothing about these contracts, but I've never liked the path of least resistance. And I will not take it now when it is not in the best interest of our taxpayers or our economy. We are going to dig down deep, rebid the contracts where necessary, eliminate the ones that we don't need, and open up economic opportunity for businesses in Chicago. Now, another important but painful choice that we present in this budget is personnel reductions. I told you many times over these last weeks that everything had to be on the table. And I have struggled personally with the prospect of layoffs. As a kid who grew up in a household where we always lived paycheck to paycheck, I have very vivid memories of when my father lost his job and we had to resort to food giveaways to eat. I do not relish the prospect of unemployment for a single city worker. And to minimize layoffs, we have leaned heavily on eliminating vacancies. Across all funds, we have reduced over 1,800 vacancies. All departments, including police and fire, gave something. This budget we are presenting today also contains layoffs of approximately 350 positions. And while we can't do nothing, hoping for an election forecast different, to be different, better days ahead, this budget assumes that no layoff notices will be issued until next year, and any layoffs won't be effective until March 1. This schedule will allow us to see if there is any new federal stimulus on the horizon. And we will continue to advocate vociferously for such a stimulus. This economic downturn has had a bipartisan impact, and there must be a bipartisan solution. So Congress, do your job. Don't leave us, cities and towns all across this country, high and dry. Do your job that we sent you there to do. And if if we get federal stimulus that addresses our fiscal needs, if that happens, that we can make any appropriate pivots at that time regarding personnel reductions. In addition to vacancies and layoffs, we are also seeking five furlough days from all non-union workers. And I will lead by example and take those five furlough days myself. 
And we have worked with every city department to make sure that these personnel reductions will not result in a material decrease in the delivery of services to our residents. And of course, in this most difficult fiscal year, our eyes have turned to our police department. I have been very clear that accountability and reform are essential and must be part of the path forward. As long as I am mayor, constitutional policing will be an intrinsic part of policing in this city, period, full stop. I am also fully aware of the complicit role that police departments have played dating back to our earliest times in brutally enforcing racist Jim Crow laws and depriving black and brown people from achieving our full rights as citizens. And these are not just ancient times, but recent history right here in Chicago. And so in breaking down these barriers, we must also continue to closely scrutinize all police practices and policies and eliminate any and all bias. But I do not believe that having fidelity to this essential work of bias-free policing requires dismantling our police department. I have been very clear that I do not support defunding the police. And while this term means different things to different people, in this moment, in Chicago, we cannot responsibly enact any policies that make communities less safe. Yes, agree that the police cannot be the first and only responders on every call uh, for help from our residents. That is precisely why in 2021, we will launch a pilot program born of real research from subject matter experts that looks at a co-responder model and starts the process of building the infrastructure for alternative means of response. But to be clear, this is hard work and it must be tested and built over time. There are no magic wands to wave, no snapping of fingers or catchy slogans, and whatever course we take must be tested on the streets of Chicago and must be built to address our urban realities and not those of some city that does not reflect our diversity, our history, or our current reality. I also reject the false narrative that it either fund the police or fund communities. We must and can do both. And we demonstrated that fact in the 2020 budget that this council passed last year. And we are calling upon you to do the same this year. And regarding the policing side of the equation, let us not forget that the federal consent decree mandated consent decree alone requires continued funding of important initiatives based around training and accountability. And also, literal defunding means cutting officer position in a department where close to 90% of the budget is allocated to personnel. And given the seniority requirements of the collective bargaining agreements, if we cut current jobs, we would be compelled to cut the youngest, most diverse, and well-trained officers in the department. And that is not in anyone's interest. But in this year, where everyone must make sacrifice, we do propose taking 614 vacancies from the Chicago Police Department. As with all departments, these vacancy reductions were done in concert with the CPD, with an eye on attrition and the reality of smaller academy classes in the pandemic, but safeguarding the resources that would be needed to keep communities safe. From last year's budget and with the creation of the Office of Public Safety Administration, coupled with an ongoing reorganization of the CPD, hundreds of officers were returned to the streets to be on the front lines of the crime fight. We will also continue to hold the line on overtime, require even more scrutiny and changes to policies that have the potential to cause harm, like the work done this year to reform police policies and training around pursuits and search warrants and protections for whistleblowers. This is good policy, common sense, 
and reinforces the necessity of risk management protocols in departments like the CPD, which can be the source of liability for our taxpayers and our city. <clears throat> and while we will slow the rate of growth, with the resulting $80 million in corporate fund savings regarding the police department, on my watch, we will never make cuts or policy changes that inhibit the core mission of the police department, which is to serve and protect us all. And let me make one final point that must be said in this moment. Our police officers are not our enemies. Yes, we must continue the hard and important work of reform. And we have a superintendent who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk every day. Just ask the TAC team officers who now, every week, without fail, must perform a community service project. That's right, TAC team officers. No more jump out boys who only show up to be the enforcers and otherwise have no relationships with communities. Those days are over and we will be the better for it all. David Brown knows and I believe that the pure authentic relationship building of community policing is the best crime fighting strategy there is. And if police are not viewed as legitimate, there is no trust. Police will never be effective and they will never bridge the divide and importantly they will never be able to truly keep us safe if they don't build those relationships. In this most extraordinary of years, our police have also endured a lot, as we all have. <clears throat> and some have fallen short of the appropriately high standards that we have set for the privilege and honor of being a Chicago police officer. And for them, there has been and there will continue to be accountability. But for the many who come on the job for the right reason and stay on the job because of love of city and public service, for them, they also have the right to be safe and to return home after their watch to their loving families. In this extraordinary year, our police officers have been shot at now 67 times, including 10 officers struck by bullets. That is a remarkable statistic. And that number does not account for the times that they have been stabbed, fired upon with injury causing fireworks, nor does it reflect the toll of broken limbs and other injuries they have suffered as a result of attacks by crowds, not of peaceful protesters, but those who came to our city armed for a fight. <clears throat> and so my colleagues <clears throat> in the city council, as you view this budget and appropriately scrutinize how dollars are allocated towards public safety, I urge you to look beyond the hashtag and think about the men and women who courageously report for duty every day on our behalf to keep us safe. People like 8th District Officers Xavier Langham and Gino Garcia, who earlier this year, while on patrol, saw flames coming from a parked car and a person trapped inside who had suffered a medical emergency. Those officers sprang into action broke a window and rescued the driver from the locked burning car. Moments after they rescued that driver, the entire vehicle became engulfed in flames. Or remember Chicago Police Sergeant Rodolfo Vargas Jr., who while investigating shots fired call, came across a victim's house and noticed property damage from the shooting. The officers carefully checked the home and discovered a victim lying on the floor inside with a, a wound uh, from the gunshot. Those officers saved her life. And the victim's family is extremely grateful. And before you paint all the brave men and women of the Chicago Police Department with the same broad brush from incidents here or elsewhere, I want you to also pause. <coughs>
I want you to also pause and remember Officer Christian Walker, <clears throat> who with his partner responded to a call of a person shot and found a precious seven-year-old girl with a bullet hole with a bullet hole in her forehead and an exit wound in the back. The girl wasn't moving, but Officer Walker saw that she was blinking and he helped apply pressure to her wound to stop the bleeding. Officer Walker watched as his child struggled for breath, and then he began performing CPR. And when the EMTs arrived, Officer Walker led the ambulance to the hospital. That young child did not survive. That is a tragic loss for her family and all who knew and loved her and will be the source of lifelong trauma, as well as a deep wound to our city. And just as Officer Walker bore witness to that young girl's former moments, and he watched her cry as her life was ending. His story is sadly not unique. Every day, our police officers answer the call, run to danger, and sometimes witness unspeakable horror, all in an effort to keep us safe. <clears throat> and I say again, our police officers are not our enemies. They are someone's son or daughter or husband or wife, brother or sister. They are as complicated and imperfect as all of us. But do remember, they are our neighbors and an important part of who we are as Chicagoans. <clears throat> as Chicagoans, we must meet this moment in all of its facets, which we are doing through the savings and efficiencies that I have detailed. To also plug our 2021 budget gap, we must also assume approximately 501 million in refinancing and restructuring of our debt. And despite our challenging economic times, we have not and will not abandon our commitment to equity and inclusion. We must therefore continue to use government as a stimulus to build wealth, deal more of our residents into the prosperity of Chicago and build back our middle class that has been devastated decade after decade since the 1970s. <clears throat> to further spur economic recovery, <clears throat> we propose making a $7 million investment in our ongoing economic recovery efforts, in line with the recommendations of our Economic Recovery Task Force, the first comprehensive recovery plan published by an American city. We propose making an additional $1.7 million investment to support our youth programs on top of the 2020 programs already funded. We will continue to make a $10 million investment in funding for housing and homelessness prevention. And meanwhile, there is also an additional 52 million in 2021 CARES Act funding that will go towards housing assistance and homelessness prevention and support. We also propose funding for violence prevention and mental health, including strengthening coordination between street outreach workers and our mental health care system, dedicated funds to reduce domestic violence and more resources to provide victims of violence with the short and long-term supports they need to begin the healing process 
after experiencing the trauma of gun violence. And to further balance our budget, we propose $184.9 million in new revenues and draws from our reserves. We propose taking a modest amount from our rainy day fund in the amount of $30 million. And to be clear, folks, we are not experiencing merely a rainy day. It is truly a rainy season. And therefore, we must continue to be prudent and cautious. This virus is very unpredictable. And we can ill afford to materially deplete our reserves now, particularly when it is far from clear that the folks in Washington, D.C. will ever be able to rise above their partisan divide. We will begin again to aggressively surplus TIF. We'll add a net of $33.5 million to our corporate fund. <clears throat> and yes, we seek a modest property tax increase of $93.9 million. Now, some had predicted that this budget would be predicated on hundreds of millions of new property tax dollars. Not so. And for the average Chicago home valued at $250,000, you will pay just 56 additional dollars for the whole year. That's right, just 56 new dollars per year. And while we will keep advocating in D.C. for our fair share of new stimulus funding, we will also keep a watch on Springfield. Now, to our partners in Springfield, as I have said before, we're in this together. We've done great things together already in my short time in office. And I know that we can work together to fully fund the local government distributed fund and avoid sending this city or any others unfunded mandates. And yes, my friends, we still need real pension reform. Now, our work in, for 2021 doesn't end with the passage of a budget. We will keep working to make government run more efficiently and mitigate risk. <clears throat> and in 2021, must mark the year where we open up new opportunities for enhanced pipelines to good jobs for people from every neighborhood. We have to open up more opportunity for, in the trades for women and people of color. And I very much appreciate those unions that have made diversity and inclusion a hallmark of who you are. But we must also agree that much more work needs to be done. I challenge us to do more, and I am ready, willing, and able to do my part to make our aspirations for diversity of the trades a reality. We need to also challenge companies who do business with Chicago to do more on supply chain diversity. We want to do business with companies who do the right things all the time because it is the right thing to do, not just and only to win government contracts. I am determined that 2021 will mark the new beginning of asking tougher questions around diversity and inclusion and incentivizing companies who do business with us to open up real opportunities for Chicago workers, small and minority owned businesses. We have work to do. Please take my words as an urgent call to action, a call for businesses to make good on their words and to be intentional about opening up real opportunities for those who have been locked out of wealth building opportunities for far too long. The city of Chicago wants to be your partner if you share our values around equity and inclusion. And so now we turn this 2021 budget over to you, the Chicago City Council, to fulfill your fiduciary duty of oversight, review, and I hope passage of this 2021 pandemic budget. I hope that the details reflect all of the weeks and truly the months of hard work that went into closing this historic gap with structural reforms and other measures. We did not shy away from the hard but necessary choices. We believe that these structural reforms will set us up well to continue our path towards structural balance, which we are targeting for 2023. And I hope that you will agree and ultimately vote to support this budget. But before I leave this podium, 
I have one last ask of this body. As the hearings commence and a debate ensues, please remember to be kind to each other. We and you may not agree on every issue, but let's have this Chicago City Council budget season be a model for the nation on how democracy, as messy as it always is, can be filled with efforts to build bridges to each other and continue on our path toward that more perfect union. My team and I look forward to working with you as you dig into the details, and we stand ready to assist you in any way possible. I do hope that when future generations look back on us as the elected leaders of this great, great city, that they will see reflected in the annals of the history that we are creating every day, that we made the right choices in this time to set up future generations for success. Our recovery is within reach. Working together, together, we can get there and come out of this crisis better, stronger than ever before. God bless you all, and God bless the great city of Chicago. Thank you. Chairman Dow, the chair recognizes Chairman Dow. Uh, good morning, thank you, Madam President. As part of the call for this special meeting, the clerk has a proposed resolution for publication and setting the date and time of the necessary hearing, and I ask now that that resolution be read. Madam Clerk, please read the resolution. Whereas Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot on October 21st, 2020, submitted to the City Council the executive budget of the City of Chicago for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2021, and ending December 31st, 2021. Whereas it is pr provided by law that at least one public hearing shall be held by the corporate authorities on the budget document, not less than one week after publication, thereof and such as the corporate authorities may determine and prior to final action thereon. And whereas it is further provided by the law that notice of such hearing shall be given by publication in a newspaper having general circulation in the city of Chicago, not less than one week prior to the time of such hearing now. Therefore, be it resolved that the budget document for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2021, ending December 31st, 2021, as submitted by the mayor to the city council, be published in pamphlet form and made available for the public inspection in the office of the city clerk and the Chicago Public Library, library no later than October 26, 2020. And be it further resolved that this public hearing on said budget document be held by the city council at 11.30 a.m. on November 16, 2020, either at an in-person location or via remote means with, means with instructions for participation to be posted online at shycityclerk.com. The city clerk is hereby directed to cause notice of such hearing to be published in a newspaper having general circulation in the city of Chicago at least one week prior to the time of such public hearing. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move to suspend the rules for the immediate consideration of this resolution. Either seeing or hearing any objections so ordered. Thank you, Madam President. I now move to adopt the resolution by the same roll call vote as was applied to determine quorum. Seeing no objections, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Madam President. A budget hearing schedule will be provided to every alderman after this meeting. The overview and first budget hearing will begin next Monday, October 26th at 9 a.m. I now move we return to the regular order of business. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Alderman Mitchell. The chair recognizes Alderman Mitchell for adjournment of the special meeting. Madam President, there being no further business before the body, I move that we adjourn by the same roll call vote as was applied to determine quorum. Hearing no objections, so ordered. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.